that, huh? <laughs> uh, I love it. The, the shoes, my shoes. That's, we're laughing because uh, Marge went out and bought new shoes yesterday. And, and I said, there you go, honey. So <laughs> we went to the Mecca. We went to DSW. Yes. Got shoes there. Yes, it was, it was something else, let me tell you. It's a big shoe store. But, uh, but yeah, you know, uh, hey, that's a good laugh. That's funny stuff. Uh, and, it, and it's great stuff to joke about. But you know what? The sad part is, it's pretty darn true. Uh, and you know what? That's one of the things that people don't talk an awful lot about. You know, as a pastor, I have a lot of people that will come to me and will talk to me about issues and problems in their lives. And let me tell you, I've heard a lot of them. And I have people that will come to me and they'll say, Listen, Pastor, I'm blowing it in this area of my life. I'm struggling with anger. Or I'm struggling, uh, I'm struggling with, with hatred. Or I'm st struggling with sexual purity. Or I'm struggling with, with all these different things. But you know one thing they almost never ever say is I'm struggling with greed. I'm struggling with my stuff. Right? Because we, we've all got stuff. And we all got stuff that we like. Uh, we like our stuff, and, and and we really get into our stuff. Sometimes we have special rooms for just for our stuff, <laughs> right? We do. We like our stuff so much. We have a stuff collection of stuff we don't need, right? And, and it, it's something that as Christians we don't talk about. It, it's perfectly acceptable. And this skit makes fun of it, but you know, we got to look and see what the Bible says about it. And and Jesus in his Sermon on the Mount, he talks quite a bit about stuff. And as we've been going through it, we've been looking at, at right way living in a wrong way world. We've been looking at the difference between kingdom living versus worldly living. And that they're really, there are two things that are opposed to each other. And, you know, if you're in the world, the idea is, is, you know, he who dies with the most toys wins, right? That, that's what you hear a lot. And, and people live that way. They can be incredibly successful and they can have lots and lots of stuff. The big boat and the new cars and the, the, the super duper house, right? Kingdom living should be different. And Jesus tells us that it is. And we're going to take a minute tonight. And we're going to look, we've been studying through the Sermon on the Mount and seeing kind of what Jesus has to say about some things. And we've talked about some tough subjects. We've talked about adultery and divorce. We, we've, we've talked about uh, being salt and light. We've talked about uh, how you're supposed to be generous, how you're supposed to give, and, and how you're not supposed to, to be a person who does it just so everybody can see how great you are. And today we're going to talk about stuff. And the right attitude towards stuff. Because it, it's my concern for you, as well as for me, that it's not you that have stuff, but it's stuff that has you. And that happens. And it's ugly when it happens. I mean, that was a great parody of it, but believe me, there's people that their stuff has them. And that's dangerous. So we're looking in, in Matthew chapter 6 right now, and uh, I just want to read through a few verses here, and let's talk and see what Jesus says. In verse 19, Matthew 6, 19, he says, Do not store up for yourself treasures on earth, where moth and rust destroy, and where thieves break in and steal, but store up for yourselves treasure in heaven, where moth and rust do not destroy, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Jesus starts talking about your treasure, your stuff. And he talks about where we ought to do it, where we ought to have it, right? And this is a tough one. Because my guess is if you're like me, the, the things that you, that, that you save up for, the things that you really want, there's probably a lot of material stuff in the mix, right? And when I, get, uh, when I get that bonus, or when I get the raise at work, 
or when we get the taxes back, this is what we're going to do with it, right? This is, we, we've got it planned out because we really want to get this. And, you know, they've got a 70-inch TV now, and they've gone to 80 inches. <laughs> That's what we need, right? That's what we're after. And we plan things out. Uh, I'll tell you one for me. Uh, when I was in high school, uh, all throughout high school, uh, I had a motorcycle. And I loved having a motorcycle. And my dad and I rode a lot. We were both uh, CMA members. And we'd go on big rallies. He had his big gold wing. And I'd follow him along on my little bike. And, and when Marge and I first got together, I had that motorcycle. We had lots of fun on it. And then the motorcycle was gone. It's been gone for a while. And every year around this time, it starts getting sunny and nice. And my, my throttle wrist starts itching, you know. And I start thinking, ooh, it'd be so nice. It'd be so nice to get a motor. And you know what? You know, I'll tell you the kind that I really like. I want a big V-twin. I want a fat boy. Okay? The, the irony of that's not lost on me. Okay? But a big old V-twin, you know. And boy, I just, you know, and I... I'll look online and I'll, you can go to the Harley Davidson website and you can build your own bike there. <laughs> you put all the little things you want on it, right? You can do all that stuff and you go, oh, it's only $18,000. <laughs> what a great deal. I'll tell you what, I'm not getting that bike anytime soon, right? I'm really not, but here's the thing. It doesn't stop me from thinking about it. My dad used to always say, you know, a man can always dream, right? And we do that a lot. But we do it about earthly stuff. And, and I'm guessing that, that you're all like me. And that when it comes to heavenly stuff, you don't spend that much time thinking about where we're going to spend eternity. You don't spend that much time thinking about how you can invest in that. You don't spend that much time uh, treasuring what you have there and working that you might have more. Jesus says, don't put your stuff here. Don't treasure up your stuff here on earth. Because listen, it's going to go away. It's the moth, it's the rust, it's the thief. It's the old saying, you can't take it with you. Let me tell you, I've done a lot of funerals, more than I've cared to have done, actually. And, and I've done a bunch. And you know, you look at those fancy suits that they have in funerals, and there's no pockets. You don't put anything in them. And, and it always surprises me as you do a funeral. A family will come up, and they'll always, there'll be these significant items that the family will, will place with the body. And sometimes it's a Bible, or sometimes it's a, a favorite picture, or it's a cross, or it's some of these things. And, and I'm not saying that those things aren't sentimental and that they don't have a lot of meaning to the people that put them in there. But guess what? I can guarantee you one thing. That person ain't going to use it. Okay? It's going in the ground. Here is where moths eat, rust rusts away, Thieves can break in. Jesus tells us here that when it comes to our stuff, we've got to have the right focus. Okay, and our focus shouldn't be on the here stuff. It should be on the there stuff. And we have to get that right. It's so important because it's easy to focus on the here stuff. But the there stuff is so much more important in the large scheme of things. And, and really, when we think of the treasure that we have in, in, in heaven, the first thing that we should think of is Jesus Christ. And He's there. And He's waiting for us. His Word says He's coming back to get us and to take us home with Him. How amazing is that? How incredible is that? He's coming back for me. You too, but for me. That should be a focus. That should be a central thing. But instead, I'm worried about stuff here. 
So Jesus says, get your focus right. And, and he says, it should be on heaven. And, and he really finishes in verse 21. He says, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So the first thing he calls us to is to focus. And, and then the next thing is he's going to talk uh, in verse 22 about the eye. And he says, the eye is the lamp of the body. If your eyes are good, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eyes are bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light within you is darkness, how great is that darkness? Okay, I read this and I hear light and darkness. And if that darkness is light, then your light is just kind of confuses me and it really isn't meant to be that confusing okay Jesus is talking about our eye it's what we see with he says the eye is the lamp of your body and if your eye is good then you're you're full of light if your eye is bad then you're full of darkness it's interesting uh, J.B. Phillips one of my favorite translations by the way if, if I can tell you any translation to go out and buy because it's just a great translation it's the J.B. Phillips translation. Uh, small side note, J.B. Phillips was really good friends with C.S. Lewis. And, and Phillips and Lewis had both fought in the Great War, in World War I. And Phillips was a, a youth pastor. And at that time, the King James was really the only Bible that was, that was prevalent. And, and Phillips wanted to make a Bible that he could give to his youth group so his kids would actually understand the Bible. So Phillips started, and he just translated a book, and he sent a copy to C.S. Lewis, and he said, tell me what you think, because Lewis was a great Greek scholar. And Lewis wrote back, and he said, it's fantastic, don't stop. So he didn't, and, and J.B. Phillips, uh, he translated the entire New Testament, and it's one of my very favorites. And uh, Phillips looks at this passage, and he talks about this, and he says, if your eye is evil... And the King James has that too. It's the idea of the evil eye, right? Now we've all heard of the evil eye, right? And we think it's, you know, you see the movies where they, you know, spit and the evil eye. You know what I'm talking about? Okay. Never mind that part. The evil eye. What's the evil eye? Okay? The evil eye is an eye, well, it's an eye that looks at something with greed. It's an eye that looks at something with a misplaced desire. Be it lust, be it greed, that's what these... So when, when someone gives you the evil eye, what they're really doing is they're looking at you going, I want your stuff. Okay? That's the evil eye. I don't know about you, but I'm prone to evil eye stuff. You drive down the road and you go, oh man, look at that car. Right? Did you see that going by? You get that evil eye. Back when we lived down in the south, I, I had a neighbor... This neighbor had the best barbecue ever. <laughs> Let me tell you, barbecues are a big deal down south. And this one was, it was huge and had a big fire box and a big stove pipe there. It was on a trailer. It was so big, it was on a trailer. Every time I drove by that dark barbecue, I went, man. I covet, I covet, right? It's the evil eye. It's the evil eye. So Jesus says, if your eye's good, you'll be full of light. If your eye's evil, you'll be full of darkness. What Jesus is talking about here is your attitude. Okay? He's talking about how you look at stuff and your attitude with stuff. And the idea of if your eye is good, it's, it's the idea of sincere. Okay? It's the idea of not jaded. Uh, I worked at retail for years. I worked for a grocery store, and I was a produce department guy. And the store that I worked by was right by the Columbia River, and it was also by the Washougal River. It was River Central. And there was a big loading dock, or not a big loading dock, a big boat launch. Uh, a big boat launch there, and tons of people would come in in the summertime, and it'd be hot. And people would come into the store all the time, not especially appropriately dressed, if you catch what I mean. Because they're going to the boat launch, they're getting ready to go out. And I'll never forget one time, um, <clears throat> I was working I was working with one of my friends, Kelly. She's like a little sister to me. I just love her to death. I, I got to do her wedding uh, a, a few years ago. And we were working together, and, and I was at the table and fixing the tomatoes. And 
Well, one of the things we had to do where I work is whenever someone came into your department, you had to say hi to them, ask them how they were doing, getting everything okay. And, well, this gal walks in, and she's not very appropriately dressed. You're kind of following me, right? She's really not appropriately dressed. She's very, wearing a very small bikini, and, and stuff's ready to fall out, right? And she comes right across from me on the table, and I'm straightening the tomatoes, and I look at her, at her eyes, just in her eyes, and say, how are you doing today? And she goes, good. And I said, you find everything okay? Great, thank you, okay. Have a nice day. And uh, I looked over after I had done this, after this gal left the department, and my friend Kelly, she was over there and she was laughing so hard she was about ready to fall over. And she said, Matt, I want you to know something. You did a really good job of not looking at her boobs. <laughs> okay? It, it, it was having a good eye, okay? That was my goal in that encounter. And it's interesting to note, though, and I want you to, to pay attention, because I didn't realize that as this is happening, but people pay attention. Right. People pay attention to where your eyes are. Men, I don't need to say any more, do I? <laughs> okay, ladies, yeah, you're not off the hook either. <laughs> but, but really, People watch where your eye is. And let me tell you, if your eye is good, you'll be full of light. If your eye is bad, if you've got an eye that wants, that desires, that lusts, that's after, you know what? That's gonna make that's gonna make the rest of you dark. That's what Jesus says. So he says the first thing is we've got to get our focus right. We've got to get our focus on above, on heaven, and not on the stuff here. And the next thing we have to do is get our attitude right, okay? And we've got to, to look at things the right way. Next, he's going to talk to us all about masters. Verse 24, he says, No one can serve two masters. Either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. Okay, uh, serve two masters. Now, this is kind of an odd saying to us. We don't have masters so much. Actually, in the ancient world, it was, it was possible to have two masters. Uh, there's cases of you know, two brothers that owned a slave, and the slave had to work for, for both brothers. Uh, so that is something possible. But you see, here he's, he's talked about our focus, he's talked about our attitude, and now he goes and he's, he's talking about these two masters. And he says you can't serve two because you'll love one or you'll hate the other. We've got to get love and hate straight here first because it doesn't mean necessarily what we think it does. It doesn't mean just, you know, these gushy feelings or really despise someone. Uh, love and hate is a, a Jewish idiom. And, and what it really means is it, it, it means how much attention or how much dedication you have uh, towards someone or something. Uh, Luke chapter 14, Jesus says, uh, unless a man hate his father and his mother and his brother and his sister, he cannot be my disciple. Whoa, Jesus, <laughs> come on. No, well, he doesn't mean hate, hate. What he means is, is I have to be the most important thing. And if you don't put me ahead of your father and your mother and your brother and your sister, you can't be my disciple. I have to be central. And it's that idea of love and hate. It's the idea that, that, that one person you're going to really devote yourself to and the other person you're just going to kind of ignore. And Jesus says that is impossible to do. So as he says this, this all makes sense. And then he says a man can't serve both God and money or mammon. Some, some translations say mammon. That's just Aramaic for money. You can't serve God and money. All right? He's just going to say it real plain. As we've looked through these things that Jesus has talked about, he's really said the same thing three different ways. I mean, in a lot of senses. He starts saying, hey, your treasure, your stuff, it needs to be focused on here, not on the stuff you've got here. Okay? Hey, your attitude, 
It needs to be focused, it needs to be clear and pure, not full of greed and, and envy. And here he says, listen, I'm just going to say it plain to you. You can't serve God and money. Pick one. But I guarantee you, you're serving one. All of us are. Make your choice, Jesus says. That's the challenge here. So we've got to get our attitude right. We've got to get our focus right. But we also have to get our loyalty right. We have to figure out who and what we truly desire to serve. Now, it's easy to say that you serve Jesus Christ. It's easy to say that you're a follower of Jesus Christ. It can be a tough thing to do. I don't know if you've noticed or not. It can be really hard. You know, we say that we love him. But we're so broken. You know, we, we say that we want to follow him. But sometimes we look at the wrong thing or we wander the wrong way. It's really easy to say these things, but it's so very difficult to do these things. And, and, and I'm not trying to, to, to make light of the situation at all. I want to tell you, I get it, that I struggle with the very same things. I know I'm supposed to be the super spiritual guy up here, but, but let me tell you, that's not the case. I'm right where you're at. And, and it's a fight because the world really tells us that we ought to be after the stuff here. The world tells us that we ought to be after the, the new car, the fat boy motorcycle, <laughs> those kinds of things. That's, you should have what you want. And, and we laugh at the, the Green Harmony commercial, but at the same time, that's what we see. You know, we used to, Marge and I laughed because for years our next door neighbor was uh, Bill Jones. And so we really were trying to keep up with the Joneses. <laughs> and, uh, he was retired, which wasn't fair. That meant that he, he could mow the lawn whenever he wanted to. And I had to work. Uh, but, I mean, it was keeping up with the Joneses, right? We do that. And Jesus is saying, pick your loyalty. Choose your side. And understand that you can't serve God and money at the same time. Okay, so he's, he's talked about our focus and that it needs to be on above. He, he's talked uh, about our attitudes, that, that we have to be sincere and not greedy. He's, he's talked about our loyalty, that we ought to focus on, we ought to focus on God, look to serve Him, and, and now He's going to talk about how we ought to just kind of view life. And see, this is part of the problem, is because <coughs> we're warriors. It's what we do. Some of us more than others. Some people are genetically hardwired to worry. And that is all they will do. Let me tell you. Um, I know some. That's just, oh my goodness. Some of us are just going to, ah, whatever. Right? That's guys are like that. I'm sorry. Most of us. Ah, just, what happens happens. Right? Well, Jesus is going to talk for a second. And he's going to say, here's how we should handle it. Verse 25. Therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is, is not life more important than food, and the body more important than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Who of you, by worrying, can add a single hour to his life. There's a challenge for you warriors. <laughs> Who of you by worrying can add a single hour to your life? The answer? Nobody. <coughs> Not one of you. You know, one of my favorite uh, favorite illustrations of worry is, is worry is like a rocking chair. It gives you something to do, but you don't get anywhere, right? You just stay in your spot, and that's, it just, you keep busy doing it, but you're not getting anywhere, and that's, that's the truth, right? So part of getting and understanding how to live a kingdom life, if we're listening to Jesus, we, we've got to have the right focus, we've got to have the right attitude and outlook, but we've got to let go of worry. 
Okay, now we're talking impossible, right? <laughs> Let's just be honest here. Let go of worry. Jesus says, listen, don't worry about what you're going to eat. Don't worry about your clothes. Life is a lot more important than that. And, and he's good enough to give us an example. And let me tell you, it's a great example. He talks about the birds. I tell you, I love springtime. The birds are coming back. And we night in our bedroom and so you get a nice little breeze coming through and lately we've been waking up and it's been birds and you can hear them out there singing Jesus says look at the birds I mean look at them they're not punching nine to five they're not driving their minivan to the mall so they can get school clothes they're not doing any of these things and look at them they seem to be doing okay. Aren't you more important? Aren't you more important to God than these birds? The answer is, of course you are. So don't worry. And this is one we hang on to. Uh, and it's tough enough uh, that, that we've got to that we've got to renew our focus and change our attitude. And then we get to this and we go, how do we let go of this? Well, the answer really is in those things we just talked about. You see, we get so caught up with here, with the now, with the stuff. And Jesus is again and again here calling us back to live a kingdom life. And he's saying, listen, you've got to get your focus in the right place. You want to end worrying? Spend time thinking about the stuff you're storing up in heaven. Quit worrying about the stuff you've got here or the stuff you want to get. Have the right kind of eye. He says the eye is the lamp of the body. If the, if, the, if the eye is sincere and good, if the eye isn't looking for what it can get, that's the right kind of eye. If you do that, you can let go of that worry if you're not always looking for something new, something better. And finally, he tells us, he says, just understand that you've got to choose. You've got to choose between stuff or God. You can't serve both. Okay, so I don't know about you, but that's about an impossible bill to fill. If I'm just being honest, I'll say I'm going to blow it again and again and it's not going to take me any longer than the next motorcycle to drive down the road or the next I mean pair of shoes that you go oh, I love those right <laughs> so what do we do how do we live this kingdom life because it's tough and let me tell you the only thing I know how to do is to rest in the grace of Jesus Christ. I said earlier that we're so very broken. And understand that we are. That in this life where we're at right here, that it's a process that God is changing us and God is working in our hearts and in our lives and he's making us more like his son. But at the end of the day, I don't know about you, but I'm still broke which is why I fall before God and fall to his grace and mercy. That's how I live a kingdom life. The first thing is by realizing, you know what? You can't do it. And if you're with me and if you realize you can't do it, let me tell you, you've reached the most important step realizing that you're not able to do this, realizing that you're broken before God. You may not be far along on your spiritual walk. You, you may not be a Christian. Church might be something that you just kind of got invited to and talked into or uh, a friend or a, a, a girlfriend or a spouse said, you're coming and you had to show up. I get that. I've been there. 
lots of good friends that have been there too. But let me tell you, if you're realizing tonight that you're broke, like me, let me introduce you to someone. Let me introduce you to Jesus Christ. You see, he spoke these words of wisdom that, that we've read. This is part of his Sermon on the Mount. And he understood where we are. He understood that, that to the people he was talking to that very day, to the people that I'm talking to 2,000 years later, that we all had the same basic problem. That we're all broke when we come before a perfect and holy God. And that's why Jesus came. That's why he went to the cross. He went there for us, for our brokenness, for our sin. That's the, the big biblical word for it. For the wrongs that we've done. He went to the cross and he took that penalty for us. He went there in our place. And, and see, if you're like me and you've admitted before God and that you're broke, the next step is to, to realize that Jesus did go to that cross for you and, and God offers you the gift of eternal life. It's not a free gift, I want you to understand. It cost him very dearly. It cost him his son. But he offers that gift and what you have to do is receive it. And if you haven't placed your, your faith in Jesus Christ, we're going to take just a minute here and we're going to pray. And I want you to know that tonight, this very night, you can take that first step to living like Jesus. You can take that first step and you can start right way living in a wrong way world. And it really, what it comes down to is realizing we're broken before God and allowing him to work in us. So let's take a, let's take a minute. Let's go to God. And let's pray. Father God, we do recognize our brokenness before you. And Lord, as we look at, at what your son tells us how to do, uh, how we can change our focus, how we can change our attitude, that, that we need a new outlook, we look at those things and we recognize that, that yes, Lord, that's what we need. That we need that change in our life. Father God, we struggle with making it because we live in a world that, that doesn't value you. We live in a world that values things and stuff that, that makes those things the, the pinnacle of success. And Lord God, we come to you tonight and we realize we're broke. And Father, we ask that you fix us. If you haven't placed your faith in Christ, and tonight you're, you're standing before a holy God, I want you to know that if you stand before him tonight and if you recognize your brokenness, if you believe that he sent his son for you, if you accept the gift of eternal life that he holds out for you, you believe that, you accept that, you confess that with your mouth, and I want you to know God will change your life he will begin to transform you. I won't lie and say it's easy, but I will say that God will change your heart and then he'll give you the desires of your heart. That's what his word says. Father God, there's many of us here tonight who've walked with you a long time and more we're still broke. We're waiting to be fixed. But Father, you're so good because you love us even in the midst of our, our brokenness. And Father, we cling to your grace. We cling to your mercy and we thank you for it. Lord God, we do want to be more like you. Father God, we pray that you help us with our focus. We pray that you change our, our attitudes and our outlook. Lord God, that you bring them more in line with your son. Father, we ask for your help because we know we're still unable Lord God, we thank you uh, for your word tonight. We thank you for these words that Jesus spoke and how they're incredibly challenging. How we look at a world around us and we 
we see that, that how your son calls us to live flies in the face of, of everything that we're taught and told is right. So, Lord God, we cling to you. We hold to you tonight that you would help us to live the kind of lives you've called us to live. Father, we thank you for this time in your word. We thank you for this time of worship tonight. And we thank you that you are the one who can change our hearts. You and only you. And we ask you to do that tonight. In Jesus' name we pray.